In the main chapel of the Unterlinden Museum in Colmar, France, is the Eisenheim altarpiece painted by Matthias Gruenwald. The Eisenheim altarpiece is composed of 12 paintings on hinged panels that originally could be opened or closed to correspond with the events surrounding the church calendar. Each panel is amazing, but by far the most stunning are those that depict the crucifixion of our Lord. The art historian Neil McGregor writes that we see Christ's elongated body nailed up to die. His feet are twisted around the pivot of a single nail. Broken off twigs and pieces of stone from his scourging are lodged deep into his skin. His hands are drained of blood and squirm in pain from nails so huge that they protrude from the other side of the wood and his head hopelessly sags under the weight of his crown of thorns. As you and I look to the right of the crucified Christ, we see John the Baptist. So even though John would have been dead years before the time of Christ's crucifixion, he's anachronistically inserted into the scene. We notice that he's pointing. The Swiss theologian Karl Barth had a copy of this painting in his study. He wrote of this painting that all theology is in that single, bony, pointing finger. The reason why he said that is because behind John the Baptist are the words that must prove true for all who seek to follow Christ. He must increase, but I must decrease. Toward the left, we see the figures of Christ's mother, the Apostle John, and Mary Magdalene. You look at them and you see them recoiling from the cross. And yet there is at the same time a strange identification with Jesus. Gruenwald gives Christ's mother's skin the same greenish tint we see on her son. John's face displays the same paint expression found on the face of his Savior. Mary Magdalene's praying hands contort, not unlike the contorted, crucified hands of her Lord. So you look at these figures and it begs the question, are they identifying with Jesus or is he identifying with them? Are their expressions reflections of Christ's suffering or is Christ's suffering a reflection of their brokenness and sin? It's telling that we read in 2 Corinthians 5.21 that he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Christ not only took our sins, he became sin for us. He became that which he was not so that we might become that which we were not. He died because we were already dead. We just didn't know it at the time. This is the weight of our sin, but this is also the miracle of Holy Week. Jeremy Begbie has noted that one of the weaknesses in some corners of our Protestant tradition is our modern temptation to bypass the stories of Monday, Thursday and Good Friday on our way to Easter. But I think we have to fight that temptation. So while it's true that we know the end of the story, the Gospels very deliberately invite us to also read the story from the inside, to read it from the perspective of those who lived through these events, those for whom Good Friday was not that good, but was in fact catastrophic. We need the perspective of Easter. We need to know how the story ends, but we also need the perspective of those who experienced these events for the first time. That's why the ancient church, as it gathered on Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, and Easter Sunday, sought to see the story not only through the perspective of its completion, but also through the perspective of those who were there, through the eyes of Peter and John, and the eyes of Christ's mother and Mary Magdalene, and through the eyes of Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, and through the eyes of the women at the tomb and the angels seated on the rock. So brothers and sisters of Tampa Covenant Church, we encourage you to take time this week to enter into this story of redemption and hope. We also invite you to join us this Thursday, Friday, and Sunday as we journey with our Lord through his meal with his disciples, his death on Golgotha Hill, and his resurrection victory at the open tomb.